Hello everyone, uh, thanks Marietta for setting up today's webinar. So My name is Chris Mills uh, and I'm going to be your presenter today. So the topic of today's webinar is on flow meter selection. So before I get started I'll just have a, a quick introduction. Uh, some of you may know me. Uh, so you can see some of the attendees uh, for today's webinar. I believe we've met in the past. Uh, so, in terms of myself, I've been at NEL now for approaching 12 years. So, I'm a consultant at NEL. Uh, my background, uh, I came here from university. I studied chemical and process engineering. I've got an honours degree. I'm um, now a chartered chemical engineer. And I'm also currently uh, completing my engineering doctorate with Coventry University. Uh, I'm almost complete, hoping to be fully finished by, by this summer. So, next time. I present, it might be uh, Dr. Chris Mills, uh, <laughs> maybe try and use my title as much as possible just to get, get the use out of it. Um, it's always quite surreal doing a webinar, uh, obviously I'm in the room just now, uh, and people could be located all over the world. Uh, just to give you an idea of where I am, we're in Glasgow in Scotland, and it's January, and as you can maybe expect, the weather is miserable. It's uh, pouring the rain, and it's really cold, So, but hopefully... Hopefully you're somewhere nice and warm, wherever you are. So today's uh, presentation is going to be on flow meter selection. So without further ado, I'll move on to the, the first slide. So the first slide I have here uh, is just the content slide. So this is going to give you an idea of what the contents of today's webinar is going to be around. You can see on the left there, actually, I've got a, a flow meter. So that's one of the flow meters installed in our EPAT facility here in NEL in East Kilbride. So just to give you an idea, again, some of you may have been to NEL, some of you may not. We have two flow laboratories here at NEL. We have the James Young Flow Facility, where we have a single-phase oil, single-phase water, a high-pressure, high-temperature uh, oil single-phase facility known as EPAT, stands for Elevated Pressure and Temperature, a multi-phase facility and a wet gas facility. So this photo that you can see here, this is from the EPAT, the Elevated Pressure and Temperature Facility. It's a Coriolis meter. And it's installed, and you can see in the background, you can see some of our other instrumentation. We also have a, a high-pressure multi-phase facility, and that's uh, one of the newest facilities we have here at NEL. You might have heard of it. Uh, we've got quite a lot of promotion just now around it. It's known as the Advanced Multi-Phase Flow Facility. So there's two large flow facilities. In terms of today's presentation, we've got a general introduction uh, to meet flow meter selection, then things that you should consider, so general considerations, uh, then discuss process conditions and how that affects your selection. Installation, so installation requirements for your flow meter selection. And then I've got a couple of case studies at the end where I can ask you some questions and you can see, hopefully apply some of the knowledge you may have gained from today's webinar. So that's the contents of today's presentation. So now on to the introduction. So as you can imagine, there's many applications in the industry that require the flow to be measured. So we're not just looking at the oil and gas industry, a variety of different industries, be it the process industry, food, pharmaceutical, uh, water industries, a variety of different uh, industries all require flow to be measured for a variety of different reasons. It could be for safety, it could be for process control, process optimization, uh, fiscal, custody transfer, a variety of different reasons for why you're wanting to, to measure the flow. And within that, each of them will have their own specific criteria and demands on the measurement uncertainty. Now, that's a term there that a lot of you might know, you might be fully aware of what the term measurement uncertainty, but others may not. Uh, ultimately, measurement uncertainty, a way to think of it is almost like the, the accuracy, so how good a measurement you're looking for. So if you have a high-value product, be it oil or high-value pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical product, for example, you want to be measuring with a, a very low uncertainty basically to be extremely accurate to minimise any errors, for want of a better term. So different uh, things that have to be measured will have a different measurement uncertainty, and that has to be taken into account when you're picking a flow meter. There's no point picking the best meter in the world if you don't need the best measurement uncertainty, and the opposite is true of that as well. If you do require the best measurement uncertainty, then you can't pick a poor measurement device. So, the correct meter for the application has to be chosen with these criteria in mind.
Now, choosing the correct meter for an application can be difficult. Uh, it can also be quite simple, but it can be difficult. At NEL, so we have a, the flow laboratories where we conduct a lot of commercial R&D, uh, commercial calibrations, uh, government funded research. But we also, as part of the work here at NEL, we do a lot of consultancy work where we actually look at uh, flow meter selections. So we look at process conditions for end users and help them pick the optimal flow meter and estimate their uncertainty and whether they achieve the required uncertainty. But So choosing a, a flow meter can, can be difficult for certain applications, but it isn't always uh, an ideal solution. To, do, to choose a flow meter, you must know the basics of how each technology works, so that's a, a prerequisite. And you must be able to justify your choices to management. Now, that's not always easy, uh, depending on who your management are, of course. Uh, you may have a, believe you have a good case, but might not be able to convince them. A lot of times, management, it comes down to cost, so you have to sell the benefits to them. So certain flow meters have different costs, as you can imagine, and they also have different benefits. So you have to be able to sell that to management. So as I said, I'm not going to go into too much depth on the different flow meters. These are just some of them. There's uh, far more flow meters than we have listed here. Uh, we run other webinars and other training courses on flow meters and their background and a bit more in-depth on how they operate, their fundamentals of each technology and the pros and cons. I'm not going to be able to cover it all in just one slide here. But what we have are six different flow meters, six commonly used flow meters that you may or may not be aware of. Probably the, some of the most common you're aware of would be the ultrasonic flow meter, a volumetric device, uh, operates on the transit time uh, philosophy. Then we have a Coriolis flow meter. So this is a mass-based flow meter. It directly measures mass and also directly measure, measures density. From that, you can infer volume flow. So Coriolis meters have the advantage of directly measuring mass and density and also be able to output volume flow as well. They're one of the most commonly used flow meters in industry, and indeed at our flow laboratories at NEL, that's the meter we see most common, most commonly now at NEL for calibration, seems to be the Coriolis flow meter. When I first started, again, that was about 12 years ago now, uh, we used to see a lot of turbine flow meters. Uh, I'd say it was almost like a 50% split between turbine and Coriolis, uh, for oil flow anyway, but now I'd say it's almost 90%. Coriolis meters that we're seeing, 95% Coriolis meters for oil flow. So it just shows you the growth in the, the market for Coriolis meters. And part of the reason is because Coriolis meters, although it's a twin tube oscillating device, there's no moving parts in the same way there is for a turbine meter, which is like a, a blade that rotates, and it rotates proportionally with the velocity of the flow. As you can imagine, when moving parts of the turbine meter, uh, it can wear, it can tear, uh, and they're prone to, to breaking over time. They also only output, as I say, volumetric flow, whereas the Coriolis meter being a direct, direct mass measurement uh, has its uh, pros advantages. We also have electromagnetic meter, which is, relies on a uh, conductive fluid, so that's applicable to, to water. We see a lot of them in our water facilities at NEL. Uh, vortex meter, which can measure uh, water and steam we don't see too many of them, and oil, sorry, as well. We don't see too many of them, but maybe a couple a year at NEL. And then differential pressure devices. Again, you've probably heard of some of the different differential pressure meters that are available, things like Venturi tubes, uh, orifice plates, uh, wedge meters, cone meters, all differential pressure devices. They ultimately measure the pressure drop across the device, and from that you can calculate your uh, volumetric flow. So that's some of the available meters, and each have their own advantages and disadvantages. Now, there's general considerations when you're specifying a flow meter. One of the first things is, why are you measuring it? Do you need to measure it? <laughs> uh, also, can you measure it? Can it be measured? Is it maybe an extremely corrosive fluid, for example, or extreme temperature or pressure? Could you use another method? Do you have to uh, directly measure it? Is it maybe a batch process? So you can maybe weigh it at the end, for example. Uh, what do you need to measure? So you always need to consider that. What do you need to measure and why are you measuring it? Is it for fiscal measurements, for example? Is it for legal, is a legal requirement? So once you've taken all these points on board, 
you decide that you do need to measure it and you know what uncertainty you require, so you know exactly what your application is and why you're measuring it and what the measurement uncertainty is, what next? Well, one of the first things we'll look at is the process conditions, which we have here. So you can imagine all different industries requiring flow measurement all have very different process conditions. So the fluid, what fluid are you measuring? Is it a liquid? Is it a gas? Is it even multiphase? So uh, liquid and gas are multi-component as well. So it could be oil and water and gas multiphase. Or it could be two component liquid, uh, oil and water, for example. So there are a variety of different things to consider, and this will greatly affect what flow meter you select. As this is a, an introductory webinar, we're only really looking at single phase today. We're not going to really consider uh, multi phase or even two phase flow, uh, flow meter selections for things like wet gas or multi phase. That might be a, a future webinar, but for just now, we're looking at single phase. You have to consider the flow range, so that's a, a big one. One of the things, the terms that relates to as well is turndown, which I'll discuss at a later, later slide you may be aware of. Then we have the temperature and pressure range that you're operating. Now, the temperature and pressure range can be an important consideration. Um, pressure range more so for the, uh, the flange flanges and whether the, the meter body is suitable for high pressure applications, but apart from that there's not there's not a great deal of considerations, maybe around how you would calibrate it for pressure effects. Uh, temperature range again that affects uh, the the construction material as well. But again there's not too much to consider around temperature and pressure range. That more relates around to the fluid properties. Now, the fluid properties greatly affect the flow meter that you're going to select. We have the, the density range and, crucially, the viscosity range. So the viscosity range is extremely important. High viscosity fluids are, can be extremely challenging for a variety of reasons. You can have a high pressure drop, but they can also be operating in the low Reynolds number range. So that's the next point we're considering there. So depending on the density, the viscosity, the velocity of your application and the, the size of the pipe, so your diameter, depends on your Reynolds number range. Now, historically, we've, in terms of oil and gas production anyway, historically, it's been turbulent fluids that have been measured, so low viscosity oils operating at a relatively high velocity tend to operate in turbulent flow regime. Operating in turbulent flow regime uh, means that the mean actual velocity is fairly stable. It's approximately about 1.2, the velocity of the fluid. And it's relatively easy to measure. Now, as the viscosity increases, you're more likely to be starting to get closer to the transitional and laminar flow range, where it can be quite challenging for a variety of different flow meters. So when we are sizing flow meters uh, for a, a client, one of the things we'll always consider is the Reynolds number range. A lot of people try to avoid operating in the transition regime. One way you might want to do that is by either over or undersizing your flow meter. Now, there's a, a lot of issues with doing this. If you oversize a flow meter, for example, you might well have a lower pressure drop because you're operating at a lower velocity. But because you're operating at a lower velocity, you're going to be operating lower down the flow range for the specification of that flow meter, which relates to the turndown that I'm going to mention. And that's when the meter has the highest uncertainty. So that's a trade-off straight away. However, if you undersize a flow meter, you're going to have a much greater pressure drop, and you might actually limit your flow through the, the device. So having a larger pressure drop, potentially limiting your flow rate, uh, all to undersize your flow meter. So again, there's definitely pros and cons and trying to avoid transition can be can be challenging. But also, this relates back to that pressure drop that I mentioned there, you need to consider the vapour pressure as well for your fluid. If you're operating for relatively low pressure and you have a large pressure drop, some of the uh, gas could come out of solution. So you could end up with uh, two-phase flow or a flashing even occurring. Again, you have to consider whether the fluid that you're measuring is corrosive. 
is it going to do any damage to a device that has moving parts, for example? Is it erosive? So again, it doesn't even be moving parts. It could just be eroding the meter body as well. So is there, say, sand included in the device? Is it going to erode over time? You have to consider these things. You have to consider what the lifespan is going to be of your flow measurement selection as well. Uh, dynamic changing flow. Is the flow range changing? Is it changing rapidly? Uh, does it change throughout the day or is it fairly stable? You have to know exactly again, come back to that term, what your minimum and maximum flow rate is for your turndown. And there will be different meter selection, meter choices for this. Some meters have a far greater flow range than others. So that's some of the meter information. Uh, what do the process conditions tell us about the required meter attributes? So turndown. So turndown is basically the maximum flow divided by the minimum flow. So if you imagine, you've probably heard the term used in the past, imagine you're operating from 10 to 100 litres a second, that would be a 10 to 1 turndown. So 100 divided by 10 is 10. Again, let's say you're operating a turndown of uh, 1 to 50 litres a second, that would be 50 divided by 1, so that's a, a 50 to 1 turndown. Certain flow meters have a very small turndown and other more digital uh, other digital devices, more newer technologies, have a far larger turndown. I'll discuss some of them uh, later on. Uh, you also have to consider whether it's sensitive to the physical properties. So depending on what the viscosity is, for example, is it going to be extremely sensitive to that? Again, if there's moving parts in the meter, if it's an invasive technology and it's a high viscosity, it's going to have a larger pressure drop than a device that's maybe non-invasive, that's full bore, such as like a full bore ultrasonic meter. Uh, the Reynolds number, so you have to take uh, account your velocity, your geometry, so your diameter, your viscosity and your density to account for the Reynolds number and whether you're going to be operating in turbulent flow, laminar flow or in the laminar turbulent transition. And then you also have to consider the sensitivity to non-ideal conditions. So as part of that you have to consider things like your, your installation and that's what we're leading on to next. So. That's a bit about the, the process conditions and considering the meter selection. We also have to consider where you're installing it, the actual physicality. So consider some of the physical constraints you may come across for your application, and there will be a variety of them. Upstream pipework being one such constraint. Now, in an ideal installation, you would have a significantly long upstream pipework before you installed your flow meter. Sadly, this isn't always the case. Uh, certain flow meters require a lot of upstream pipework, others less so. So flow meters such as turbine meters, ultrasonic meters, typically require in the region of 10 to 20 diameters of straight pipework upstream, about 20 for an ultrasonic, maybe 10 for a turbine meter. You can install a flow conditioner, so either a uh, a straightening bundle or a flow conditioning plate. However, these will have an additional pressure drop. One of the uh, real advantages of using an ultrasonic meter, apart from its low measurement uncertainty, is the fact that it's full bore and has a minimum pressure drop. However, if you have to install a lot of upstream and downstream pipework and a flow conditioner plate, then there's obviously going to be an associated pressure drop across that measurement system. So you have to take that into account. Uh, other flow meters are far less sensitive to upstream pipework. Indeed, Coriolis meters pretty much are relatively uh, unaffected by upstream downstream pipework, although good practice, was, good practice would suggest that you should have some upstream and downstream pipework. We typically go for at least 5D upstream and downstream, just so that you're not putting any unwanted stresses on the device. You don't want to install it directly onto a bend, for example, or a valve. You always want to follow good good practice. So that's your upstream conditions. But you also have to consider the downstream. Now downstream for all flow meters is less the requirement for downstream pipework for all flow meters is less than the requirement for upstream. But again, good practice specifies that you should always maybe have in the region of five D downstream. Again, certain meters may even say ten D downstream. Now, if you're installing a flow meter, I would always favour putting additional pipework upstream than downstream. So, for example, if you had, say, 20 diameters of pipework, approximately, 
I would aim for having about 15D upstream, 5D downstream nominally, rather than splitting it in the middle and having 10D upstream downstream. I would always try and have as much pipe work upstream, make sure the device is seen a good flow profile, rather than having it downstream. But downstream still is important. Again, you don't want to have a valve or a bend directly after a flow meter. Now, the other physical constraint a lot of people forget is actually where are they installing it? What's the space like above and below? Now, certain meters um, are the size of the meter body. So a turbine meter, for example, isn't much larger than the meter body. It might have a, a head unit on it, for example, but it's relatively small and it will be similar in dimensions to the pipework. However, a meter such as a, a Coriolis meter, which is a twin tube device that oscillates, you might have seen them. You've seen them from the, the image on my opening slide. You can see that they're actually quite large devices. Uh, so you have to consider where you're installing it and also the orientation. Now in the image at the start, you can see we installed it what's known as tubes down. So the flow is still going from left to right, but they go through those tubes flowing downwards and back up into the main line. So you have to ensure that you have enough space above and below the flow meter. So if you're line is installed pretty much on the ground, then you can't install a Coriolis meter with the flow tubes downwards. You could potentially rotate it and have flow, tube, flow tubes up, but again, this is something you have to consider when you're specifying a flow meter. Now, if we're talking about flow meters, they are regularly recalibrated. Uh, indeed, that's one of the main areas of business for NEL, is the recalibration of flow meters. We calibrate flow meters for a variety of different industries. So you have to consider if you're going to be removing the device to send it away for calibration or even for just routine maintenance. How easy is it to get access to the device? How are you going to remove it? And some of the things you have to consider are the height. So basically, where is it located in your system? Is it located high up? How are you going to get access to it? The weight of it is an extremely large, bulky device that's going to require maybe a crane, for example. And then you've got to consider, in a lot of cases, when you're installing a flow meter, you're not simply just installing the flow measurement technology. You're going to be installing other additional equipment. And that other additional equipment is going to require um, considerations for the physical installation of it as well. So I've got a, a slide here coming up. So imagine the flow, the flow going from left to right. You can see we have two valves downstream, a double block and bleed. And then we have a flow meter. Uh, the flow meter is the one with the, the Q above it. So basically that's a measured quantity, be it mass or volume. So you can see you've got our, our flow meter installed. This is our nice process line. Looks like there's plenty of upstream diameter pipework and there's plenty downstream. Now, seldom would it be the case that that is your measurement system. There would be other instrumentation included. You would probably want to include temperature. So you probably want a temperature measurement but you want to install it so that it's not interfering with your measurement technology. So it would be located suitably downstream, but not too far away downstream, maybe in the region of 3 to 5D downstream, or 3 to 8D downstream, sorry. Then we have a pressure tapping. Again, you want to measure pressure. Again, suitably close to the meter, but not too close. Depending on the product, a high-value product, or if you think there might be another component, for example, if you're measuring oil and there might be water, you might need a jet mixer sampler. So you might need a sampling equipment for a jet mixer. So you can see there we've got a takeoff point located just after the flow meter and a re-injection point with sampling system uh, upstream of the flow meter. So imagine that's flowing round and round in a loop. We're taking a sample off and we're looking at physical properties. So we could be looking at the density. So we, that could be going through a densitometer. Uh, it could also be getting analysed as well for water and oil content as well via a variety of different water and oil monitors that are, are available. If you're doing that, you're probably going to need a flow computer. So a lot of that's going to then feed into a flow computer, your temperature, your pressure, your measured quantity. If you've got a flow computer, you're likely going to have a, a data historian to store the data, so a data acquisition system, and also a control room. Uh, maybe with a SCADA system for controlling the various different instrumentation. So what I'm trying to drive home here is it's not as simple as simply picking a flow meter. 
One, you might already have an uh, existing application where you're looking to swap the flow meter. So you're going to have to consider all the other additional instrumentation that goes around it, the other additional equipment, and whether that will uh, work alongside your new technology. So does your new flow meter feed into your existing flow computer? What are the outputs? What are the inputs to the flow computer, for example? All these things have to be considered. That's why it's not always an easy choice. You also have to consider environmental conditions, and the environmental conditions here in East Kilbride, right, where it's uh, pouring a rain right now and, and freezing cold, one of the things you do have to consider is things like the ambient temperature. You can imagine if it, you're offshore, for example, the ambient temperature is a lot lower than it would be maybe if you're in the Middle East, out in the desert, for example, or even just the ambient temperature in a laboratory, such as NEL. It varies greatly, and this has to be considered. So too does the humidity. Sunlight, again, not much an issue just now in uh, East Kilbride. We're not seeing a lot of the sun just now. But if you're in, say, the desert in the Middle East, a lot of times direct sunlight can affect. There's been studies, uh, been research completed on flow meters. Sunlight can affect the, the, the flow meter, whether that's even simply just heating up the meter body, the electronics. It can affect it. A lot of them are installed now maybe in a temperature-controlled environment or at least with a canopy to protect them from direct sunlight. Uh, wind, again, imagine the wind and rain offshore, uh, challenging conditions for your flow meter. Uh, yeah, exactly, the wind and the rain. And also, depending on where it's installed, you might even get uh, electromagnetic interference. So you have to consider whether that's going to affect the device or even just the signal outputted from the device whether that's going to be affected by potential electromagnetic interference. So these are all the things that you have to consider. And you also have to consider whether it's operating in a hazardous area. So again, these are all challenges that will greatly affect what flow meter you select. And also, some of these environmental conditions also affect the physical constraints as well in terms of getting access to it. When it has, it's not going to, very seldom will you just be installing a flow meter and leaving it. You potentially have to perform maintenance on it or remove it for recalibration. So all these things have to be considered. And then this one, I've left this to last, but this is potentially uh, the most important one in a lot of cases. If you have to scope a flow, uh, spec a flow meter and then put your business case together, the application uh, and the budget are extremely important. So you have to keep thinking back to the application, the budget, and the reasons for measuring. There's no point spending a lot of time on something that can be ruled out early. So there's a variety of different flow meters available for an application. If you have a really high measurement uncertainty, there's no point specifying a really expensive, high-accuracy device, for example. So there's a process we like to go through, which I have in the next slide here, the meter selection process. So what you want to do is state your requirements and most importantly uh, state the, the criteria as well. So state what the requirements for it, for the measurement and also the criteria. Then eliminate non-suitable technologies early. So if it's oil, for example, you can rule out an electromagnetic meter straight away. So that's the best process. Try and reduce down the number of technologies because something you have to consider, each technology has several different manufacturers. So I would never just pick one technology, one manufacturer when I was doing a meter selection. You would want to have a couple of different meter technologies, and then within that you'd also want to look at a couple of different manufacturers, because flow meters from one manufacturer to another can differ in terms of their performance, and also, crucially, the cost. So whilst you might think that a meter type X from manufacturer A is extremely expensive, you might find that meter technology X from manufacturer B is actually relatively inexpensive, but it might have a, a, a poorer uncertainty, for example. So there's, there's things to consider. Whilst you want to eliminate non-suitable technologies, you don't want to close yourself off too, too early. But you do want to use the process, the physical and environmental conditions to narrow down the list. So you want to kind of use like the funneling technique. Start off with a lot of options and slowly but surely start to narrow it down, but don't don't narrow it down to just one choice. Try and keep a couple. 
so that you can go out for quotations and you can at least get a better idea and make sure you're getting a, a reasonable price and uncertainty for your application. Then you want to review your final decision and before you're finished, you want to basically repeat the process. Basically go back through it, have it as like an iterative process where you're whittling down and you're getting to the, the optimum measurement solu uh, solution for your application. It might be the case that there isn't one obvious answer. Uh, in a lot of cases, for a certain application, there might not be one obvious answer. You might need to compromise. So that's basically what we're saying here in this next slide. Measurement selection in a lot of cases is all about compromise. You'll find there's no one meter to match all situations. So there's a variety of different conditions. And there's also a variety of different flow meters for those conditions. There's probably no perfect meter for your application. And one of the things you'll probably have to compromise the most on is the, well, you can't, sorry, one of the things you probably can't compromise on is the project budget. That's probably one of the things you have an idea of at the very start, would be the project budget along with your uncertainty. The uncertainty might be able to change slightly, but the budget is unlikely to change. Your practicalities in, uh, in terms of physical properties and physical constraints are, won't be able to change or are extremely unlikely to change, but the one that's really unlikely to change would be the project budget. So you've always got to kind of keep the cost in mind. So that's a bit about meter selection. What we have now are some, some case studies. So this is a chance, hopefully, to put some of the, the knowledge you may have about flow meters uh, for certain applications and pick the potential the best flow meter for that application. So this is case study one. So there is a need to install flow measurement equipment on outlets of a test separator. Which meter would you choose for each stream? So imagine this is a, an offshore application. There's a, a separator system. So when uh, oil and gas is produced, let's say, offshore, we're producing it as a, a multi-phase fluid, so oil, water, and gas. We've got three process streams coming off the separator. So we have nominally single phase water, nominally single phase oil, and nominally single phase gas. In reality, they're extremely unlikely to all be single phase. They would definitely have other components, other phases involved. Now we have nominal flow ranges we've put up here for each, uh, for each parameter. Uh, we've got minimum Reynolds numbers, the temperature, we've also got the pressure. We've got the upstream diameter length. We've got the required uncertainty. And then you can see we've got some comments here. Now, the comments are quite crucial in a lot of cases. So I'll let you have a quick look through that, and then I'm going to ask the first question uh, on the next slide. But I'll bring the, the table back up again. But if you just want to have a, a look through this, so this is the, the water stream, the oil stream, and the gas stream. And you can see that they all vary. And what we're looking to do here is pick a flow meter for each of the streams from a multiple choice list. So we go back, uh, sorry, we go forward to the next slide. So this is for the oil stream. So which meter would you choose for the oil stream? Would you choose the electromagnetic meter, the Coriolis meter, a positive displacement meter, or a differential pressure meter? Now feel free to use the chat function on the site and you can uh, have a guess. You can either write A, B, C, or D and pick what you think might be the most applicable flow meter for this oil stream. I'll move on to the next slide while some of you comment. So I'm just narrowing it down just now. You can see I've blanked out the, grayed out the water and gas stream, and now we're looking at the oil stream. Now if I was looking at this, some of the key things I would look at straight away for picking the flow meter would be, what's the turn down? So remember from before, I said the turn down is the maximum divided by the minimum flow range. So for this application, that's 100 divided by 10, which is 10 to 1. So a lot of flow meters operate over a 10 to 1 turn down fairly well with a reasonable linearity and uncertainty. So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't seem too onerous, the flow range. You look at the next thing that catches the eye is the fact that it seems to be operating with a, a very low Reynolds number. So a Reynolds number of 200 would definitely be operating in the laminar flow regime. So that, that tells me that it's a relatively high viscosity fluid, potentially, as well. 
So maybe you not want to pick a meter that's dependent on um, not having a large pressure drop, for example. <clears throat> Another thing that catches eye is upstream diameter length. We've only got five diameters upstream, so that's not a lot of pipe work upstream, so maybe not wanting to pick a flow meter that requires extremely long upstream diameter lengths. And then the next crucial point is uncertainty. You can see 0.2%, that's an extremely low uncertainty. So you're going to be looking for a, a very accurate device, a device that has a very low measurement uncertainty. So from that, I'm hoping that you've all picked. And also, sorry, we have the comments. You should always look at the comments here because there can be other things that might catch your eye. You can see here it says may contain either water or gas carry under. Now, up to 10% of the volume. If it's got gas in the oil stream, <clears throat> that can be extremely challenging, but can also potentially do some damage as well to moving parts within the device. Uh, if there's any like slugs of gas coming along, so you might want a device that's maybe non-invasive non or at least non-intrusive. So if we go back to the, the options, I've seen quite a lot of you picked this. The vast majority of you picked the Coriolis meter, and that is indeed the, the correct answer. And the reason for we can rule out electromagnetic meter because that requires a uh, conductive fluid, so that's suitable for water. Uh, PD meter. Now, PD meter is, is actually a very good meter for high viscosity fluids. Uh, it's not overly affected by, or it's not affected by Reynolds number either. However, the comment section on requiring uh, saying the fluid may contain water or gas. That's one of the reasons why you'd want to rule out a PD meter, because it's an intrusive, invasive device. Uh, the DP meter, again, you probably want more upstream diameter lengths than 5D. Also, it probably struggles to achieve an uncertainty of 0.2%. So factoring all these things in, Coriolis meter has minimal upstream uh, requirements. It's extremely accurate. It has a low measurement uncertainty. It can handle uh, secondary phases without causing any damage to the device. It can operate at low Reynolds numbers and it can easily achieve a 10 to 100 uh, flow range. <coughs> so next we're going to go look at the, the gas stream. So the four options are ultrasonic meter, Coriolis, PD meter, <coughs> and differential pressure. So I'll bring the, the table up. Um, once again, if you want to put your choices in the, the chat box, I see some people have started already, which is very good. So I've greyed out the water and oil this time, and now we're only looking at the gas stream. Now, if you want to have a go at guessing which flow meter. Again, if we look at the turndown, it's uh, 200 to 50. So again, that's not too great a turndown. That's 4 to 1. That's actually relatively small. As it's a gas, obviously it's low viscosity, high velocity, it's operating at really high Reynolds number, so that's okay. And one of the good things, we've got a lot of upstream lengths here, we've got 20 diameters, so that's making sure we're not ruling out any technologies that require a lot of upstream diameters. The uncertainty, maybe slightly challenging, at 0.5% for gas, there's only certain meters that might achieve that. And then lastly, we look at the comments. Now, the comments is the one that really gives it away for me, makes it easy to pick which flow meter. What we're looking to do here is limit the pressure drop to minimise any liquid dropout. So you don't want a significant pressure drop. So to me, that rules out any differential pressure meter straight away. So let's look at the options again. And I can see quite a few people have picked the right answer, which is good. The correct answer for this case is ultrasonic meter A. So Again, there's pros and cons, and not to say this is 100% the definitive answer, but it's, to me it's the most obvious one for this flow range. There are other options available, though. Ruled out differential pressure meter, partly due to you wanted to limit the pressure drop of the application. Uh, positive displacement meter, maybe not overly suitable to, uh, to gas measurements, although they can, they can be used. The fact you've got 20D diameter upstream means that you can install something like an ultrasonic meter. It will achieve the 0.5% uncertainty, easily work across that flow range, and have no issue with the Reynolds number.
depending on how high the flow rate is, might have ruled out the Coriolis meter. Coriolis meter may also be an option for this flow regime, but for this case, we went for ultrasonic meter because it will have a far smaller pressure drop. Coriolis meter will have a pressure drop. If you're trying to limit, you might want to look at an ultrasonic meter. So well done to everyone that got that one right. Uh, and then we've got the last stream, which is the water stream. So we've got four meters here. We have the electromagnetic meter, Coriolis meter, positive displacement meter, and differential pressure meter. Now let's bring the stream up again so we can have a look at it. So you can see we've got quite a wide turndown range here. We've got 1,000 over 50, so a very large turndown, so 20 to 1. We have a high Reynolds number range, as you'd expect, because we're operating with water, low viscosity fluid. So we're not going to be operating in transition or laminar flow, so we're not overly concerned by the Reynolds number range. However, we've only got five diameters upstream, so we don't want to pick a device that needs a lot of upstream lens. One of the good things, because it's water, a relatively low value product, we only require an uncertainty of 1%. So we don't need to pick a really highly accurate device. We might be able to pick a, a cheaper, less expensive device. But also, just look at the comment there. We may have some oil or gas carry under, so maybe we want to look at a device that doesn't have any other moving parts. So, if you want to have a guess, and I'll bring up the answer in a second, quite a few people have guessed already. Now, remember, as with all applications, there's no one obvious, obvious answer, or there's no one definitive answer. There's maybe one more obvious than the other, but there's always different options. Now, for this application, I would pick the electromagnetic meter, and that's partly down to you only require a 1% uncertainty. Um, the flow range is fine, the, in the installation looks fine, and so does the Re Reynolds number range. A mag meter would be a lot cheaper than a Coriolis meter. A Coriolis meter would definitely be able to measure this as well, but it would be more expensive. So for an application that requires a relatively uh, high uncertainty, it doesn't require it to be extremely accurate, I would pick an electromagnetic meter for this application. And that's what you'll commonly find installed in a lot of cases for a water stream. Now, we've got one more case study to complete. So, a bit more writing here, so feel free to read it. I'll read it out in a second. <coughs> so, for this case study, you're required to measure a corrosive flow, so that might be crucial that it's corrosive, over a turndown of 20 to 1, and a minimum Reynolds number of 50,000. The temperature is 85 degrees Celsius, and there are over 100 D of upstream pipe for measurement. Which flow meter would you choose? So here's our options. We have a clamp on ultrasonic, we have a Coriolis meter, a turbine meter, and lastly a differential pressure meter. Now let's go back to the case study again and we'll pick out some of the key points here. But if you want to have a go at guessing just now, so A, B, C, or D, again, feel free to use the chat function. You can see some of your answers. We'll look at the case study and we'll see what are the key points that, that jump out in this case study. Well, the flow is corrosive, so you don't want a device that's going to be invasive, that's going to be potentially affected by the, the fluid, so it's going to be damaged. So corrosive flow would be something that I'd be concerned about. There's over 100 diameters of upstream pipework, so I'm not concerned with installation requirements, which is good, so that doesn't rule anything out in that regard. Uh, operates at 85 degrees Celsius. Again, that is maybe a concern, but it doesn't overly affect my selection. Um, minimum Reynolds number is 50,000, so we're in the turbulent flow regime, so again, not overly concerned with the Reynolds number range and the flow profile that we're operating with, or the flow regime, sorry. So from these points, Two crucial ones for me is the fact that it's corrosive. I want a non-invasive device. It's relatively high temperature, so again, consider that. And the fact we've got over 100 diameter of pipework and a wide turndown, I'd be looking at an ultrasonic, and in particular, a clamp on ultrasonic. So a clamp on ultrasonic with relatively high uncertainty, maybe, but for this application, I suspect it would be more than appropriate. Turbine meter could be damaged by the corrosive flow. Same true of the Coriolis and differential pressure meter. Coriolis meter is another potential option, but for your 
the fact that ultrasonic meters are going to be relatively inexpensive also can be moved as well. That's one of the real benefits of a clamp on ultrasonic meter. You can install it, move it, check it, and then reinstall it as well. So there'll be no damage from the, the corrosive flow. So thanks for attempting the questions there. A lot of you got the answers correct, so well done. Hopefully you've learned a lot during this, today's webinar. I'm just going to summarise now. We're nearly finished. So flow meter selection can be a difficult task. Sometimes there is no perfect meter to choose. We generally have to compromise for a specific application through knowledge of the process, knowledge of flow meters, uh, and also looking at things like the environment and installation requirements. So thanks for listening. Uh, I've got some questions uh, from the chat function at the side, so I'm just going to pick a couple of these. I think we've still got some time, so I'll just go through them just now. So just looking through see some of the questions we've got here. Um, one of the first questions <coughs> is relating to high viscosity fluids. So I've been asked which flow meter would be most suitable to a very high viscosity fluid. So there's no one obvious meter for high viscosity. There's, there's a lot of things you have to consider. Now there is options, but you have to consider things like your, your installation conditions. You have to consider whether because it's high viscosity, is it going to be operating in the laminar transition? Uh, does the viscosity vary? So, although it's high viscosity, is it, is it operating always at a stable temperature, stable viscosity, or does the viscosity vary a lot? Now, for me, if the viscosity didn't vary a lot, and there wasn't any issue with pressure drop, I'd maybe look at something like a PD meter, which operate very well with high viscosity fluids, but they don't operate well when the viscosity varies because the performance indicator known as the K factor, varies significantly with viscosity. If that's the case, I'd maybe look at something like a Coriolis meter. Coriolis meters operate very well with high viscosity fluids. Um, or maybe as a slight Reynolds number effect as well, which we've noticed with various different models of Coriolis meters. But for your uncertainty, a Coriolis meter might be the most appropriate. One of the things you also have to consider, uh, one of the questions I can actually see here is regarding proving considerations or calibration considerations. So whether it's on-site proving or whether it's off-site uh, calibrations. Partly comes down to the physical in terms of how you would remove it, send it for calibration, but you also have to consider how do you prove it on-site. If you have something like a small volume prover, for example, how are you going to prove a, a Coriolis meter? or an ultrasonic meter can be more challenging than proving, say, a turbine meter or a PD meter on site. You might want to instead send it um, to a laboratory that uses a gravimetric reference, for example, if it's a Coriolis meter, rather than using a volumetric prover. So, and that's definitely something that should should be considered when you're doing a flow meter selection, but as this is only an introduction, we've not covered it in great depth. I think I've got time for maybe just one, one more question. Um, so this one is saying, what flow meter should I use when my process contains a lot of sand? Now, this comes back to maybe a bit about if the flow is erosive. A lot of processes do contain, contain sand, especially the oil and gas production. Oil can contain uh, <coughs> a lot of uh, erosive material, be it sand. In that case, you really want to put a device with minimal or no moving parts. So something like uh, a Coriolis meter would probably be appropriate. If it's in the water stream, you could potentially use a, a mag the electromagnetic meter. The set of meter you want to rule out straight away would be something like a turbine device, for example, because that's going to get damaged extremely quickly. So again, there's, no, always, there's not always a definitive answer. There's pros and cons for everything. You have to consider all these. I think that's as yeah, pretty I much at the ever yeah. mark. So oh, I'll pass over okay. to Marietta. Right, thanks a lot for that, Chris.